Okay, we're back live in Los Angeles or Irvine, California, right in Orange County, 12 miles from Newport Beach. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE.TV's uh, continuing coverage. We go to the events where there's announcements and action, and we uh, talk to the smartest people we can find, extract the signal from the noise and share that with you. And uh, this is our first CUBE event where we're showcasing servicesangle.com, our eight-month-old publication growing very rapidly, thanks to our readers and our viewers, so I appreciate that. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE.com, and I'm with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're here with Kevin Smiley, who is a consulting partner for cloud computing within HP. We've been talking all day about the support side of the business. Uh, uh, Kevin is in the consulting side. Uh, That's and right. so uh, the, 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 the lead in oftentimes, you're probably talking to a lot of CIOs. You just came off the keynote um, at this event. So how do you feel? Feel good. It was a great opportunity. We we talked about a lot of good product topics today related to cloud, but we closed with how we bring all those together and what we can do to actually help clients decide which path to choose to go into cloud and actually start to achieve the benefits that it offers to them uh, for their particular company and their industry. So big theme around <clears throat> pathways to the cloud, um, implying that it's a uh, it's not a rip and replace, it's not a forklift, you know, it's an ev evolution. Talk about that a little bit. How, how real is that? Sounds good, how real is it? Well, it's very real because companies have a service delivery model in place today. They're already delivering services from a technology perspective. And cloud is another technology service that they're looking to bring in and incorporate into that model. And it's not a matter of simply pulling out, say, their, inter their current internal platform or replacing an outsourced service with cloud. It's how do you integrate that into how they manage the services, how they govern them, how their customers use them within the business. And so it's not as simple as just pulling out the technology and putting something new in or buying a service in the marketplace. It's much more comprehensive than that. So Kevin, can you break down the current state of the union relative to cloud? Obviously we've been, we, we have a section called Cloud Angle on Silicon Angle. Wikibon does the premier research in the area. So going back a year or two, you know, the, it was all nice and segmented out. Private cloud, public cloud. Right. And then hybrid cloud became the, the buzzword du jour right. about a year and a half ago. So what is that, what's what's the landscape look like? Obviously underneath all that, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and SaaS, all layer on top of that, mobile, social. So let's talk about the middle section. Uh, private cloud is pretty much, we know what that is, it's on-premise related stuff. Right. Public cloud is Amazon, Google, Rackspace. In this middle, this new hybrid, is it, is it really a hybrid cloud or is it more, that's the delivery of it? Because consulting and services is really plays in that middle ground between those two, well, the enterprise and public. How should we look at that in the middle ground there? Think of it as a who owns what kind of conversation. So in the private cloud, the customer owns the resources that are delivering the service and the people that do the work related to it. In the public cloud, the service provider owns the services, they define the service, they actually decide what can be done and what can't be done in the service. When you think of the hybrid space or the virtual private cloud as, as we refer to it as well, it's a condition where the client wants to be able to define the policies and how their data, how their processing is managed and have someone else actually manage the infrastructure, in this case a cloud infrastructure, to deliver that. So it's a form of a managed service but okay. with more direction provided by the client. Okay, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. I want to, this is a good, this is a good, great segue. So you got essentially private, public, hybrid, or middle cloud, and then uh, the, on the other axis you have ownership, right. meaning ownership of the resources, right. um, policy definition, right. how to handle that, you know, private is owned by the customer and then service provider. Uh, what other dimensions def would be on that chart? So if I was going to build a little chart out. So for example, service levels. A, a very important aspect of this and why customers were looking for something in this space to begin with. Uh, in the public space, everyone gets essentially the same thing. It's meant to be a consumer model. Uh, in the private space, of course, the client can define the service levels however they want. Uh, and they want to be able to take advantage of sharing those resources across organizations, but still have some control over what kind of service levels they're buying. And so service providers in that virtual private cloud space provide companies the opportunity to be more specific around what service levels they buy and what that means for their business. That means they can move more into that model than what they had in, available to them in the public space. Is there any other, any other points on that? As ownership, policy, SLA, control? Secure, well, security is a huge factor. That's probably the, the biggest one for moving out of the public space 
and coming in. The security, which you can interpret as an SLA around that, yeah. but still, it's a, it's a topic that warrants its own conversation. So that is a non-trivial, correct, uh, concept uh, and, and especially implementation environment. Um, HP obviously is in a position to lead that. What do you call it? Virtual private cloud correct. infrastructure. What do you need from your ecosystem to actually succeed? Well, it's a it's a challenging environment because you have what you want to be a shared pool of resources across a set of customers that don't necessarily have shared requirements. So where the public model is able to take advantage of that very easily mm -hmm. because they define what people can get. In this space, you want to be able to address as many of those clients' needs while providing that level of security, service level, policy definition that they want. And that's a complex challenge because you're fundamentally sharing the facilities, you're sharing the infrastructure, the network, elements of this uh, and still providing the client enough flexibility to define what they want. How about support? So let's, we're here talking about services. Oh, yeah. So you have shared support? You have, so on a private cloud? In, you, a, in a private cloud, you, you either have your own support or you're hiring someone like HP and the services we just rolled out um, to provide that support. In a virtual private cloud, you're buying that support from the service provider. And in a public model, you're getting it at whatever degree that customer or that company provides it. Well, so that's, that, I, I can sum that up. It's, um, uh, we'll do our best, but if we fail, email us. <laughs> yeah, or, or spin up a new virtual instance. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a problem. I mean, you guys actually provide support to the service providers. Yes. Now, they're providing the shared support. So, is it the tail wagging the dog or is it HP leading that? I mean, so in the middle ground there, that shared area, how does support play it? How do you guys, what's your offerings well, there? Well, we're, we're bringing out a service uh, from our enterprise compute service that's going to, and does for a limited number of customers right now, provide that in a way that hasn't been done in the market before. The underlying technology to actually manage the ability to define those policies, those service levels, et cetera, is something that HP has developed as part of putting that service together. And as we get it out into the market more and gain more acceptance, our customers are going to find that it offers them a level of service and a flexibility that they haven't found in other virtual private cloud providers but in the but market. I want to go back so, to the, so, hold on, you, so are you saying then that HP will provide some unique technology to the service providers to enable them to abstract away the complexities of service so that they can actually support and or manage. Well, it, what I just described, we're actually providing for our virtual private cloud service as opposed to providing to, it's a unique intellectual okay, property. for HP. For HP, On that, So that'd be a private cloud offering. Well, it's, it's a service that we're providing and focusing on our enterprise services customers, our outsourcing customers. So, um, so uh, I wonder if we could talk about this hybrid that John was hitting on before, sure. uh, because because I want to talk, ask, ask about your philosophies, because it would seem to me that to succeed, you need some degree of homogeneity um, within that hybrid cloud environment so that you can set policies that are consistent and you're maybe sharing multi-tenants with like-minded organizations. Uh, at the same time, HP is so diverse, such a large customer base, such a large you know, portfolio of partners. So you support VMware, you support Microsoft, you support Red Hat. We're very friendly. Very friendly <laughs> to the ecosystem. How do you reconcile that need for homogeneity, or, uh, homogeneity with the diversity of your portfolio? Well, what we do is recognize the fact that we have a very complex environment today out in the world. Customers need a lot of different things, and, but they want a way and a path to actually bring that together over time. So while the industry is moving towards more standardization, more uh, homogenous operating environments and things, they need a way to get there from where they are today. And that's what we provide in our technologies uh, across the board, largely, uh, to be able to help them mi make that migration into those more standard environments. As they go, hopefully there'll be a lot more standardization. You know, we continue to drive and support open systems in the market, and that's a foundation for what we do. Uh, but I, we also aren't naive to think that that will be the only standard in the market over time, and there will continue to be a need to be able to bring those diverse standards and capabilities together. So Kevin, in your, in your consulting activities, what, what's hot amongst CIOs? What's on the top of their minds? Well, cloud is certainly one of those topics, and it's driving a lot of other conversations around storage, for example. Uh, we're seeing clients looking at their current storage environment, and the growth and explosion of data, uh, both structured and unstructured, that's hitting them, and what they need to do in order to uh, update and make that environment much more cloud ready 
and able to handle the growth that's occurring. Uh, that's one of those topics that we're seeing a lot around. So it's data growth, um, cloud, obviously you've talked about security before. Security is pervasive. So I mean, I mean CIO's got to be a little freaked about the cloud from a security standpoint. I mean, yeah. they, don't, they don't trust the cloud, right? I, I used to be one of those <laughs> prior to joining HP. I wouldn't want to be one of those right now. I, I wouldn't sleep much and it would be a real challenge because yeah, one of the there's hottest, so much facing. One of the hottest trends on our site right now on services angle and on silicon angle is mobile security. And it's constantly, because mobile is a big part of service and sure. employee access, et cetera. Um, so let me, I want to just ask you the question about platform as a service. So we, we've seen a lot of you know hubbub about Oracle, Salesforce, companies like that who are touting pass. VMware um, has Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. um, HP's announced they're in beta with some similar offerings. Right. Um, what is the state of platform as a service? Is that just a path to nowhere? Is it the... Um, is it going to be commoditized? How does that fit into the whole hybrid, private, public? Long term, like decades out, it will be commoditized at some point. Right now, and for the foreseeable future, it's going to be an expression of a variety of different relatively closed environments. I mean, you described the companies yeah. that were in that space. Heroku did it with Ruby. Right. And, you know, HP's view on that is to, again, go to open standards and make those standards available to everyone and be able to work from that perspective. A number of our competitors and our partners as well are going on more proprietary views of it. So, so basically if I can translate what you said into kind of common language, it's roll your own infrastructure. Pass is essentially... To a certain degree. Use standards, create a platform and put it out there so you can empower SaaS apps. Correct. That would be kind of like, right. I, want a, I want a platform, I want it in the cloud. It's or, or empower apps that I have in my organization that I want to make the equivalent of SaaS apps. Yeah, that's it. And then obviously infrastructure as a service, a little bit underneath all that is a lot, a lot of the sweet spot where you, uh, HP's ESSN division plays. Right. There we've seen some advances on configuration management, automation. How is that playing into it? That is, is that going to be the, is that going to be the hardened top, if you will, as Paul Moritz would say? The infrastructure as a service is more of the hardened top where it's just there and the actions at, at the pass and the SaaS level? I think it will. It's a, it's an interesting situation because so many organizations struggle with managing their infrastructure themselves today. So a lot of those developments that you're seeing to drive the improvements to provide cloud services are actually driving performance and, and behavioral improvements in IT organizations that should have been there for a long time. Uh, so it's a good behavior we're seeing come out of it and it's going to establish a set of expectations across the industry of what it means to provide infrastructure. So it, it, companies won't uh, put up with, to a certain degree, some of the levels of infrastructure service they've seen in the past, and we're working with a, a variety of companies to help them accomplish those types of improvements. One of the areas that you see as the biggest investments of IT organization is development, right? Um, and it's very high leverage, uh, and a lot's changing there. Uh, you're seeing new tools, new programming languages, you're seeing new uh, models of IT operations like DevOps, mm -hmm. where applications and infrastructure people are being cross-trained, and, and, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, that intersection of application development and infrastructure management, and, and what you're seeing in your client base. Well, what we're seeing is companies that don't want to be impeded by the availability of their infrastructure to develop and drive their business through their applications. I mean, that's essentially what a lot of the cloud conversation is about today is I need my business to move faster, which means I need my technology enablement to move faster. So my applications have to be able to adapt and respond to market changes much more quickly than what they have in the past. In order to do that, I have to have a flexible infrastructure that can move at that kind of pace. That's one of the reasons our support services that are coming out are a nice addition into the marketplace because they keep that kind of support going at the speed that cloud needs, things working and available in a proactive manner versus just a reactive manner. So I saw a statistic today earlier in the keynote, uh, I think it was a Forrester number, that the the, the line of business is adopting the cloud 25%, no, 2.5 times, times faster than the IT yes. operations. To, I mean, they have to come together closer, but do they have to be identical? Do they have to be completely aligned? Or are the advantages of private cloud, security, trust, the SLAs, the control, uh, enough so that they can be somewhat slower? Well, IT's role, part of IT's role is to have a fiduciary and, and protective responsibility for the company, risk management, mitigation, around some of these. So the business can grow and demand things that have pays faster than what they can respond today, uh, partially because they're trying to protect the interests of the company, not letting it go too fast. Um, 
it doesn't change the fact that the business wants to move at that pace and probably faster, frankly, if it could. Uh, so it's a matter of IT organizations getting to the point where they understand how they can bring their own internal services as well as external services together to increase that speed while still serving that fiduciary responsibility. So, so Meg Whitman today in her video said that uh, the cloud is going to be bigger than client server uh, as a trend. Yes. What about cloud creep? Are you worried about that? Is that going to happen? <laughs> is it going to be like distributed computing? And Was there a client services again? creep? Yeah, I, I think so. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Distributed about computing, and an I IT mean, was called in to bring it all. Pretty massive there. growth sector, yeah. Yeah, but I, 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 I think it's a I think it's a potential issue and a significant issue for the industry, uh, particularly as you're referring to the different platforms and services that are coming out. In order to take their existing environments and actually bring them together in a cloud, they're going to rely on where those platforms came from. So by default, they're going to start putting services on some of those environments that they don't necessarily want to because they don't work well together. Someone's going to have to integrate those. They're well, going to have data needs and, and things that span those different clouds. Well, I mean, Dave, I think, I mean, my opinion on that is I think with cloud, like client server, I think there'll be a little bit of a slush funds going out there, a lot of consulting dollars and, and services. You know, we've seen it already with the boutiques evolving, but ultimately when it comes down to the business drivers, Yes. Client server quickly moved to this is a business driver. Making so, money off of this, so yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's economic. If the economics yeah. change and the technology levers are there, with this, those, some of those security things you talked about can be fixed, then I think it's a real deal. We'll have something there. Um, well, so, and you saw what happened early when those technologies first came out. Businesses realized they could go do it without going through central IT, and quickly went out and started doing things on their own. We're seeing similar behaviors yeah. in cloud today. So on the, let's talk about rogue IT. Are you seeing a circle back to, okay, we've done some rogue IT, and we're seeing it with Hadoop and big data for about a year earlier. Now it's like, okay, it's a real deal. So there's, a, there's an element of, okay, rogue's happening. It's a pattern, it's a trend, and why is it happening? Okay, so bring it in-house. Right. What's the roadmap there? Because everyone's been doing rogue IT. And right. rogue software development too, by the way. Oh yeah. So you got rogue, <laughs> rogue IT. It's a cycle though. Yeah. I mean, with each change in technology that comes out and the way services are used, business keeps finding ways to expand out and, to, and grab technology services that then IT has to assess what's important to them and pull it yeah. back in. So what do you say to the CIO and his staff, and even down to the trenches, I got rogue IT, I got rogue software development, and oh, by the way, my compliance is completely broken because people are bypassing compliance rules because all the applications that they're writing in a rogue way to get them hit the time to market right. is all breaking compliance. What do you guys say to them? Like, well, uh, you, besides you're screwed, uh, you know, <laughs> what's the pathway? Was this part of the job description when you <laughs> signed up? No, it's a matter of... No, these are real issues that we're finding. They, they are real issues, and, it's a, and you're right on the compliance aspect in particular, is it's a risk to the company. And that's the approach we recommend they take when they're talking to the business about it, that by not doing certain things, they're putting assets of the company at risk exposing them particularly around security concerns when they take these approaches and don't take a holistic view of how to provide those services to the company. So what do you say to that guy? So you're in a meeting, you're having dinner, you're saying, okay, I, I, it's a therapy session, I laid out everything, and you're doing, uh, what do I do, doctor? Well, the patient's on the table, what do you do? The, the first thing I would do is look at what the policies are and what can be changed in those policies to begin to drive. A lot of these cloud services and where that creep has occurred, or that rogue IT has occurred, has been because people can use their corporate credit card to go out and buy a service. Well, when we've had these conversations with CIOs, we've asked them if they've gone out and looked at the spending to see who is buying service from these service providers in their organization. They're often amazed at how much is going through the corporate spend and actually trying to drive that back in, putting policies in place to control where they can charge on those personal credit cards and beginning to drive those policies through. So that's the, that's the stick. I think there's a carrot aspect of that too, John, which is, and I've said this, you and I have talked about this a lot, is that CIOs are in competition with cloud service providers and they need to transform their organizations and be the most attractive choice for their internal constituency. Yeah. So they, they can use the stick but unless they deliver the value. It's the transformation message right. day we've been seeing. I mean, it's up, it's so disruptive. It's really the perfect storm in IT right now because you have such a fundamental economic and technology lever, same time the human aspect of it with the labor pool and the demand for new skill sets is just causing all kinds of massive disruption, so. Well, and to that end, where the CIO has a trusted relationship with the business, they're in a good position to actually be a broker of those services 
and represent the business needs. Right. Where they don't have that trust is where they struggle. Yeah, it's all about when they have the credibility, they can succeed. All right, John, yep. we're getting the hook. Okay. Um, <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> this bad. is a great week. We should have been an hour with you, really. Uh, we're going to follow up with you, if you don't mind. Where Absolutely. are you located? Uh, Dallas. Yeah, perfect. We have an office in Dallas. So I'd love to have you on the Cube again. We could probably go on an hour and do a deep dive there on some of the cloud, especially some of the matrix we were putting together. Um, it's funny you brought that up because Dave and I actually put a project together where we're breaking down the private, public, and the shared mm -hmm. and kind of putting the key you know, uh, variables together. So I really appreciate the insight there. It'd be fun. Thanks for having me.